This lecture will be in English. And we are very privileged to have Francesca Porri. Was that right? Yes. Yes, good. Uh, here with us today. And she, uh, she's Italian. Um, she's a journalist. She holds a master's degree in foreign relations as well as uh, um, <coughs> law. International law. She's a specialist in, in uh, human rights. Yes, right? international law and human rights. Good. And she, she uh, used to work as a human rights officer. Then she found out that uh, this is not working. I have to do, I have to write, I have to be a journalist to show the world what is going on in many places, such as Syria, where she was the last journalist to leave. The last journalist to leave Syria. And she has been to the Balkans and she has been to Palestine, Israel. <coughs> so we are looking very forward. She's written two books, by the way, on the Balkans and uh, Israel and Palestine, and maybe Syria as well. It's forthcoming in one Forthcoming. Month. Good, good. So I'm very proud to introduce this. Woman that has come all the way from That was a bit weird. She wasn't supposed to be like that. Um, well, Francesca, please. So this is the place. Um, this is the place where I come from, and still, uh, this is the place where I hope to be again uh, in more or less uh, ten days. This is Aleppo today. And this is where you find yourself when you are a young freelancer like me. And this is the front line, and I don't know if you can see very well. But anyway, this is a fighter on your, uh, on your uh, left. I mean, this is a fighter. And you have... Um, this is your first day. This is the place when you are embedded with a rebel group and you enter the city. This is the place where your driver stops. Um, and you have to cross, and this is where your story starts. So this is what the front line looks like in Aleppo today. Um, it's not a, it's not a war, you know, like uh, we are used to used to think, especially my generation. You know, the uh, war like in a PlayStation, like you know, um, um, I was born in 1980. Um, and so for me, okay, Bosnia, when I was, uh, when I was uh, you know, 12, 13 years old, it was a civil war, but uh, when I was at university, you know, studying to become, a, uh, to become a diplomat or to become, you know, a UN officer, something like that, um, was uh, mainly was after 9-11. Uh, so was the idea that you know now now uh, this kind of you know uh, zero casualties war and this idea that you know how are how are you have you have the U.S. on one side or, or any, any, anyway strong powers on one side and then you have I think of Kosovo you know the so-called humanitarian war it was 1999 April 1999. Kosovo was also the first experience I had abroad. I mean, I started from the Balkans. And Kosovo was a kind of paradigmatic war at the time, you know, because the idea was we can uh, promote human rights all over the world, even through humanitarian intervention. I, you know, uh, think over this was humanitarian interventions, really. I mean, it's a. Uh, uh, I don't know if the two worlds can go together, but anyway, this is what I was told of in my university years, you know, these wars where you have zero casualties, if you think of the uh, NATO uh, forces. And then, of course, you have, you know, the dead on the ground, but they are Albanians, they are Serbs, they are Muslims, they are, you know, they are Africans, like in African wars, or they are, like, you know, like in Syria, and so who cares? They are second class dead. And so the only uh, life, you know, that are really important for us are our lives. And so I was, you know, uh, I grew up with this idea that, well, 
sometimes we can use, you know, force. Uh, force can be, you know, uh, a means to reach other hands like peace and so, you know, uh, please, from now on, whenever you are told, you know, like I was told in my university years, so whenever you are told that there is such thing like a humanitarian intervention and that you can achieve something in your life through force, through weapons, please remember that this is a front line. It's never a zero casualty war. It's <coughs> never. This is the biggest lie that I've ever, you know, heard about. This is, you know, what I was supposed to do in my life. I'm very happy, you know, that in the end I ended up in this hell. I'm very happy, you know, to live in this place and not to live, you know, in my golden cage of some human, UN office or, you know, embassy somewhere in the world. Because, you know, maybe today I could be uh, I mean, planning somewhere a humanitarian intervention, you know, thinking that in the end, you know, it's a clean war. It's, a war is clean only if you are, you know, 10,000 meters high on a plane. <coughs> Wars for a pilot on a jet is always clean. But for us, you know, when we are on the ground and jets are, are over our heads, it's never, never clean. So this is what the true front line looks like. And it's not, you know, even if Today, we are in uh, 2014, and you know, our technology, drones, this is, you know, this is war in the drone years. And I'm sure, I'm sure, because one day, if I survive Aleppo next week, one day I will, you know, have my boots on the ground in Pakistan. I'm sure that I, if I go to Pakistan tomorrow, I'm told, like you, because I've never been in Pakistan, uh, I'm told by newspapers, you know, that there is a drone war. Uh, like in Gaza, there is a drone war. I'm sure that when, when my shoes will be on Pakistani ground, I will find something like that. I'm pretty sure. And uh, will be very happy to be, you know, to be wrong, but I'm sure that even in Pakistan, the drone war of the, you know, of the, the new century looks like this. It's, I mean, today, today war is strange for me because this is, uh, postcard of Aleppo today, this is the landscape of Aleppo. I mean, it's strange because, um, I, honestly, I didn't want to become a world journalist in my life, and still today I don't define myself as a world journalist. I follow stories I'm fascinated by. Uh, today, Syria, tomorrow can be something else. Uh, for example, I would love to write something about cancer. Uh, I mean, I'm a writer, so I'm... I'm um, I'm driven by curiosity. Um, and I don't like the definition of world journalist like many other journalists, actually, to be honest. Um, because wars are not only, you know, the ones that are fought with weapons. Uh, those are only the most visible wars. And there are social wars, for example, you know. And they are as uh, dramatic as actual wars. Uh, ah, so I don't like this definition of uh, world journalists, but this is, you know, uh, what, what, Aleppo looks, uh, what Aleppo looks like uh, today. Um, and probably this is something that, you know, uh, you, simply, you simply don't see, don't see anywhere uh, in the media. Uh, it's strange for me because um, in the end, you know, uh, things in life happen, so you happen to be something at some point, and, you know, I studied to become a diplomat, and in the end I'm a journalist. Uh, that's to say that I never write in my life. I'm, I love reading, and I tend to read everything, but um, it's curious because I'm, you know, I'm a typical carnival readers, and, and still, if there is a kind of books that I never liked is the kind of books that today I'm writing. And I'm so, um, unfortunately, uh, if you give me, for example, a book on, uh, I don't know, on Venezuela, uh, I barely know where Venezuela is and, and something like, uh, maybe the, the best thing that I know about Venezuela is that the wife of one of our, of one of our most famous Italian football player comes from Venezuela. This is, you know, the, the best, the, the main thing that I remember, and a few other other details. Uh, 
so I, I was never particularly interested in kind of books, you know, on, and especially in uh, uh, books of war. Um, maybe because my, you know, personal reasons matter. My grand maternal grandfather was a general of the Italian Air Force, was a fascist until his last day, and my mother was the opposite, was a feminist, so, you know, the typical clash. Um, and so my mother absolutely, uh, you know, uh, forbade him to talk with his young uh, and only female, uh, you know, uh, niece to talk about war and everything. And, um, and then when now, you know, in, I've been in Amsterdam the last two months, two months and a half to write my book on Syria. Um, and I was reading uh, nothing new on the Western Front. Uh, so sorry, you know, to admit that <coughs> I only read the book now. Um, of course, I knew the book, but I didn't actually read it before. Um, it's curious because whatever book you read about war um, can be the First World War, the Spanish Civil War, can be Bosnia, can be Vietnam. It looks like Syria. Uh, all the wars, <coughs> in some way, looks the same. And so, you know, I read about the First World War. And, uh, and, I read about, uh, and I read about my days in Aleppo. And I think also that without a caption, or without having me here explaining you that this is, you know, Syria, probably you might think that this is, uh, uh, this is some place like Grozny uh, in, uh, in uh, Chechnya. And um, you can see a, you can see a, a hole here. And this is also the other thing that you are never told when you study. That's the hospital, the main hospital of Aleppo, Shifa Hospital, was the main target of regime air force um, since the beginning, the Shifa Hospital. And, um, and Syria has been covered as a war by a small group of young freelancers, especially photographers. And I have to admit that, you know, even if, even if our coverage, you know, was for sure wasn't enough, whatever, but, you know, have to, uh, these photographers uh, spent all their days in the hospital and was really under, um, under shelling continuously all around the clock. Uh, when, I, when, when we arrived, September 2012, August 2012, Aleppo was an explosion every six or seven seconds. So when we entered the city, uh, there was, you know, friends coming out, and I remember they, they told us, uh, you know, uh, they were completely shocked, and they, they, they told us uh, uh, only one thing, never, never, never count how many seconds pass between one explosion and the next, because otherwise you get crazy. And this is, of course, the first thing that I did, uh, as, a, you know, as soon as I was in a lab, almost really six or seven seconds all around the clock, 24 hours seven days every day, you know, there was no shelter, nothing, especially because Syria is great, but unfortunately the beautiful Syrian architecture is based on, you know, these houses with, um, with no basement, uh, one or two floors, nothing more, and the courtyard, uh, open courtyard in the middle, so there's really no shelter. Um, and so this, this is, uh, this was a like hospital, because the other, thing that you are not told, uh, well actually, uh, you are told that there is a distinction in war between civilians and combatants, and this is the pillar of international uh, humanitarian law, or better, uh, uh, the, the, the law of war, of, of the law of war, or armed conflicts. There's no distinction at all between civilians and combatants. And, and actually, it's not true that civilians are uh, col a collateral damage or worse. Civilians are today the main, uh, the main uh, uh, object of war. I mean, if there is a target, it's a civilian target. So this was the main target for the regime, the hospital of Aleppo. And um, uh, you, you cannot see very well the photo was vertical, but anyway, um, the <coughs> This is, I mean, what you usually see when you walk around the Aleppo, which is, you know, there's not only uh, shelling and bombing, it's full of snipers. So usually you walk in Aleppo, and this is what happens, that somebody 
is shot uh, more or less behind every wall. You can be sure that you know uh, there are snipers, and of course you cannot you cannot see them. They are really everywhere. So it's a it's a city of of bombs and bombs and snipers. And there are no hospitals anymore, there are no ambulances, so there is, this is the way if you are shot. This is the way you are taken to a, not to a hospital, taken to a private apartment to get treated in some way, or, or you get treated in the middle of the street, simply. Um, since hospitals are the main target. And so you walk in Aleppo. Um, and it's very normal, I mean, you don't even care anymore, there's blood anywhere um, and there are wounded in any, in any basement, in any place, you find somebody like, like this um, and still you are, you know, under, you are always, uh, you know, in the, in the eyesight of a, of a sniper and if it's not a sniper, of course it's, uh, it's bombs. Um, this is the this is the aftermath of an attack. This is April 2012. Uh, this is you know uh, immediately after an airstrike. And this is also the most dangerous thing that a journalist can cover, especially a photographer. Uh, so chapeau to photographers who, who do a job even worse than mine. Um, because usually after the first missile or after the first strike, there is always a second one, which is the real one. Because the, the real target is not, uh, you know, a building. It's all the people who will go to rescue the first wounded. This is, you know, the, the unbelievable logic of war. And so usually when you find the body in Aleppo, Body, bodies come always in couple. You have the first death, and then you have the second death, who is the guy who was trying to rescue the first one, who was hit by a sniper, or was hit by a second missile. And if you don't get shot by a sniper, or you know, if you don't um, don't die in an airstrike, this is a gas attack. This is you remember probably last August uh, near near Damascus, um, and so this is what we usually see every day. I mean, today, especially uh, since um, December, um, Assad um, uh, found another kind of weapons, uh, even uh, cheaper than gas, barrel bombing, so uh, oil barrels filled with explosives and uh, with, uh, with shrapnel and, and today is using is using these makeshift bombs with frequency of mortar fire consider that mortar fire is it's i mean better not to be under mortar fire but you can survive mortar fire unless you are hit uh, directly uh, you cannot survive barrel bombings like this and this is so this is the situation on the fine in a few in a few days, um, usually bodies aren't recovered, uh, aren't recovered, uh, you know, from the rubble. So the the alive and the dead in Syria usually live, live together. Um, of course, then you know um, when you when you go on the field, when you have boots on the ground, the other thing that you immediately discover. Um, is that no, no, nothing is in black and white. Um, I'm usually asked, for example, if it's easy for me not to take side, you know. Uh, because, you know, usually when you live in such a place, or for example, I've been for three years in Palestine. Or Palestine is the typical country where, you know, you, you really feel involved. Uh, and many activists, many journalists, you know, in the end, uh, fuel the conflict in some way because it's very difficult you know to uh, to to be lucid in palestine um, and actually it's um, for me it's the opposite it's not uh, it's not difficult at all uh, to to remain i mean uh, balanced 
because this is what happened, for example, in uh, uh, in uh, in Aleppo in February. This is the okay the river of Aleppo. Uh, the river is between uh, Aleppo is divided in two. It's divided between uh, uh, East Aleppo and Western Aleppo. And today, nobody in Aleppo would say liberated Aleppo and occupied Aleppo. At the beginning, when still this war was a revolution, uh, Syrians spoke of liberated areas and, you know, uh, occupied areas. <coughs> occupied areas were the ones still under regime control. Today, like in any war, like with Berlin and like with, you know, many other cities in our history, uh, they simply speak about Western Aleppo and Eastern Aleppo because today, today you have two regimes instead of one. You don't have liberated Aleppo. In, in so-called liberated Aleppo, you have an Al-Qaeda regime which is, you know, as uh, terrible as the regime on the other side. So these are bodies that, you know, today in the river you, you can find fish and, and bodies. And um, these are, you know, men executed. These executions, you know, happen probably uh, in the other side, so regime at Aleppo. Uh, the problem is that today you have execution also, you know, in the, in the areas controlled by Al-Qaeda. So uh, the other thing that you discover when you are on the field <coughs> is that never is black and white. And so that's why, you know, it makes no sense when we, uh, when we think that we can step in, you know, using force or using, you know, there's no innocence in war. And so today, for example, in Aleppo, uh, it depends, you know, um, the body that you find in the river, it depends on the current. You know, simply, sometimes they come from regime held Aleppo, sometimes they come from rebel held Aleppo. So in the end, uh, the only thing that you know, uh, you see in, uh, in Aleppo, this is a playground. Um, this is a playground, uh, this is what looks like, you know, being a child today in Aleppo, uh, living in the rubble, or uh, sleeping in the street, or, uh, or maybe fighting. Uh, or maybe starving, uh, or maybe you know you are simply already dead. Um, because the other thing is that it's never true when you read or you are told that you know uh, there are only fighters, um, and you know there are only fighters left and civilians fled. Never, never. I will show you. It's outside of this. This. Slide show uh, um, a photo that the UNHCR um, distributed a few days ago. Yarmouk is a Palestinian refugee camp close to Damascus, uh, an area where journalists cannot cannot reach, and thousands thousands of people starving in uh, in this in Yarmouk. And we were told uh, there are only fighters left, more or less 500 civilians. And then you see suddenly in this picture thousands of civilians, you know, with no aid, no aid at all. Uh, because the other thing is that there are no humanitarian organizations inside. So we are used to think that even if there is a war, there are some good guys that are distributing bread in some way. And <coughs> there is nobody because he is completely sealed off. Nobody can enter. No journalists, no humanitarian organizations. So you know, you have. This is the way. You know, this is uh, Syrians are completely alone, and so this is the way in the evening they look around to check, you know, for their relatives or friends who are missing, and they check if they are still alive or if they are among among the dead, because wherever you go, I mean, wherever you go in Aleppo, you can never be sure. This is, for example, this is again a vertical photo, sorry, but you know, when you enter a building, a normal building, you know, this is the way snipers are inside. So wherever you go, even if you don't see nobody, you know, you can be shot immediately. And this is, um, this is a charity. This was an Islamic charity, because the only, the only way to get some bread or some clothes, some blankets or some medicines, you know, that is uh, going to an Islamic charity. So when we ask ourselves why Al-Qaeda is so strong, why Islamists are so strong, let's ask ourselves who is distributing humanitarian aid. 
because our NGO, sorry to say, well, I can, I can speak here openly because the only, one of the few, let's say, there is Doctors Without Borders, great job, inside Syria. Uh, there's the Norwegian Refugee Council, who's doing a great job. But the majority of other NGOs uh, are collecting money saying we are distributing aid to Syrians. They are simply on Turkish border and um, delivering aid to Syrian refugees, which is something quite different from Syrian displaced, because the difference is that a refugee is outside Syria, a displaced is inside Syria. So it's, uh, one thing is helping somebody who already fled Syria, one thing is helping somebody who is in Aleppo. And inside Syria, you don't have humanitarian aid. Because what the majority of our NGOs are doing is fighting each other, not cooperating each other, and as you know, probably most of you know something about NGOs, organizing nice party on the Turkish border. Um, because you know, it's not when we, when we uh, we criticize the UN officers for the for their nice life, five star hotels life, and this is sorry to say this is also you know the sad term of NGOs of today's NGOs, not all NGOs of course, but you have these few officers who are trying to do their best to work with a majority of young guys, you know, young NGO workers who are simply war tourists. And uh, so this is an Islamic charity in Aleppo was bombed during the night. Um, because again, uh, the most dangerous place in Aleppo is a bread line, is a hospital, is you know a charity. This is the first place that, that can be bombed. These are the main targets. For example, in Aleppo and in old Syria, um, the Assad regime never bombed uh, the Al Qaeda headquarters, or uh, you know, uh, because Al Qaeda is in some way helping, of course, Assad, because the real reason why uh, the West doesn't intervene in Syria is because, you know, who is going to replace Assad? We are afraid that, you know, if, uh, if, we, if Assad um, uh, steps down, he's replaced by Al-Qaeda. So Assad is very happy to have Al-Qaeda on the rebel side, and that's why uh, Al-Qaeda facilities uh, have never been bombed. And uh, you cannot say, oh, we don't know where are their bases, because, you know, you can ask me the address of Al-Qaeda in Aleppo. I mean, I can give you, the, you can explain you how to reach. It's a, it's a very, it's a huge base in the center uh, of Aleppo, never bombed, never been bombed, while this is the places that are bombed, you know, civilians. Um, really, civilians are the main target of, of the war. Um, it's, the, it's the only... Uh, and, and it's also, I mean, uh, when, we, when we think that, when we're told that we can reach some goals, whatever, whatever they are, with the, uh, with the force, this is what the only thing that force achieve in the end. Uh, this photo has been taken in August, and, uh, and this, is a, this is an execution, an archive execution. Uh, this is an infidel according to our kind of standards. Um, so this is the only thing, you know, uh, achieved today in Syria after, uh, well, um, we don't know how many victims um, uh, there are in Syria because the United Nations decided to stop the counting the dead in January. The, the United Nations said that it was too difficult to count the dead. So instead of stopping the war, they stopped counting the dead, so the official death toll is uh, uh, 120,000. Uh, today, there are, of course, uh, unofficial countings. It's more or less 150, 140,000, 150,000, plus uh, 50,000 missing, and plus what we call the, the secondary death toll, which is uh, <coughs> impressive. The secondary death toll is all the people who die, for example, because a stupid thing. Uh, because um, you don't have any medicine at all, so you can die of you know normal diseases like even abscess, <coughs> and you can, you can die of everything, uh, of cancer or everything. Also, you know? this is the secondary the toll, which is really impressive in Syria. So we are already at the level of the uh, Bosnian civil war, uh, but still actually there's uh, 
no reaction at all uh, in the international community. So this is also uh, you know, a good question probably for uh, a good question for um, for you since you are studying the you are studying also in total you have been studying the peace movement. Uh, a good question is why the peace movement, the European and American peace movement was able to you know uh, to mobilize for uh, for Bosnia, for Iraq, and why not why not for Syria? So uh, this is also a question for, for ourselves. Ah, for you actually is the question. Uh, these are of course very really actual images you have shown. So uh, I guess that you are perhaps a bit in shock now see the realities of war. But this is reality. And uh, we have to acknowledge that. Um, I think it's not, uh, this is it. All the horror, all the Do you have any numbers for the deaths of the military faction? Uh, you mean the fighters? Yeah. No, no, and uh, it's impossible to. Well, um, this is also something, um, uh, something interesting. I mean, it's. Uh, I think it's typical of any war, especially with uh, you know their own casualties. They tend to, you know, to say nobody, uh, nobody. Died and it's, um, it's curious because, for example, uh, one of the key battles, especially for Aleppo, has been the battle for the airport. Um, not because from the airport, the airport is like 10 kilometers from the city center. Uh, not because, um, I mean, you think that there is strategy, you know, in war, you hope that are fighting according to strategy, at least. Uh, no, actually, definitely not. Um, because this is not an airport used by the regime air force. Missiles start from, I mean, uh, they are fired from southern Syria, so this is not an exercise. Okay, we, we must occupy the airport, and so, you know, we, we don't have bombings anymore. No, this is not the reason. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's in a, let's say, that is on, it connects, it's, it's important because through the airport, uh, regime forces can have, uh, you know, uh, can get weapons, but anyway, uh, it was the key button for Aleppo. Uh, it, it's, it was strange for me that, you know, the key button was not so key, you know, in a strategic point of view, but anyway, that's to say that uh, all rebels of Aleppo put all their forces, you know, in this struggle, in this battle for the airport. Um, when you ask, you know, them, okay, but how is going? How many dead? And no, no, it's, you know, they, they always tell you regime casualties. And then uh, they didn't want uh, journalists around. They always told us, no, it's too dangerous, no, it's too dangerous. Uh, then I happened to talk with a Kurdish fighter. Kurdish are in a strange position because, you know, they are, let's say that they are waging, they are fighting their own war because. They are trying also to have, you know, this Kurdish state, so it's uh, a war within a war. So this Kurdish group was a little bit different from other groups. And this guy told me, oh, you know, uh, we are fighting at the airport and it's terrible because we have shifts for three weeks. So we stay three weeks at the airport and then uh, one month uh, at home. Uh, and he was shocked because he told me, uh, usually when you fight there, there are so many dead that you take over under the bodies of your dead friends. So, you know, I was very curious, and the only time that I was able to reach the, the outskirts of the battle, not even the core area of the battle, was still like uh, trench warfare, like, uh, like, like in the 19th century. You will never, you will never uh, get, uh, you know, the, the real, uh, real figures, never. And, and also there is this, you know, mix between civilians and combatants, so it's also difficult to understand who is a civilian and who is a fighter. 
it's impossible to, to distinguish. It's really mixed. And I think that this is, for example, as for me, as a former human rights officer, this is the most also worrying thing because you know international law, international humanitarian law is based on this distinction between civilians and combatants. If you cannot distinguish between, if you cannot discriminate between civilians and combatants, I mean, in wars, it becomes, I mean, if the main target is a hospital, if the main target is a bread line, I mean, for me, it's, I remember the first thing that I've been told when I, I was still in Turkey, still have to cross the border, and a friend, a journalist, told me, oh, you know, if you want to, to be quiet tomorrow, it's your first day, you know, stay on the front line. Because the, the, the two sides are so close, um, as you saw, you know, are so close that the jets never bomb the front line, otherwise they can hit, uh, you know, loyalists, not rebels. That's also why, you know, if you stay on the front line, it's a paradox, at least you have not their strikes, but the most dangerous thing that you can do is stay in a hospital. Uh, Doctor without borders, the most dangerous thing that you can do is stay in one of the hospitals, they are really heroes because they are really under the target. I happen to be treating in one of the hospitals, and they have uh, these hospitals in a small city. Uh, so, you know, it's really a, a small town, and they were like two missiles per week. I mean, in a, in a small town, two missiles per week, at some point you are going to die. And they were still there, they were really heroes. I mean, not like journalists, really heroes. It's really, they are really doing a great, great job. What do you think for the opposite group? They are fighting with Assad. And how many groups there are? Uh, the, the, those who are fighting with Assad? Yeah. Uh, well, in, it's, uh, in terms of sheer numbers, it's more, more or less is the same. You have the same numbers of fighters <coughs> on both sides. Uh, the problem is that the majority of, uh, again, Keep in mind one thing, that uh, um, whatever we know about the war, there is the filter, you know, we know something to journalists. Um, unfortunately, journalists, uh, uh, it's also something I understand, uh, don't clarify you what are the conditions they are working in. So, first of all, let's say, we cannot, we have to decide as journalists if we want to cover rebel health Syria or regime health Syria, no? You cannot do both things, uh, because if, like me, uh, you stay in rebel health Syria, then you don't get a visa uh, to go in Damascus, for example, no? So a journalist cannot have a clear, a complete picture of the situation, no? So it's very difficult to make this kind of, you know, of comparisons, which are, I mean, essential for understanding something, no? Um, and then consider also that uh, when you cover rebel health areas, you cannot move freely from one place to another because rebels don't control a continuous part of territory, no? So you cannot really cover all rebel health Syria, or you cannot really, co uh, co uh, really cover all regime health Syria. You can cover only fragments of Syria, no? Unfortunately, as you can imagine, competition among journalists is terrible. So if I call somebody in Damascus, Please, can you tell me something about, you know, you are covering regime and Syria, can you tell me something about fighters on the regime side, and let's try to put together these fragments of information and give our readers a big picture? No, come on, because, you know, we are there not for new readers, we are there for our awards and for our career, so nobody will answer this question. So this is also the main point, and this is a shameful point of what our, we journalists are doing. So that's also why it's so difficult to answer this question. Uh, what we know, you know, is that numbers are the same. Uh, I can tell you what's the problem on the rebel health uh, side, that you have, uh, you know, thousands of fighters who are completely uh, unskilled fighters, who are people like me and you, you know, at some point, you know, we, we, get, we get a Kalashnikov, okay, go, go on the front line. I mean, you, you can imagine what, what you were able to do on the front line tomorrow, no? This is the majority of fighters on, in rebel ranks. And then you have a minority of fighters who are skilled fighters, uh, well-equipped, with 
good weapons. Unfortunately, they are all foreign fighters coming from Saudi Arabia, Afghanistan, Chechnya. They are the jihadists, the Al-Qaeda-linked jihadists. And that's why, in the end, even if they are a minority, um, the radical, radical Islamist or rebel side should be around less than 10,000, the Al-Qaeda group. They are ruling now rebel head areas. Even if they are really a minority and even if uh, Syrians don't want them, they are ruling because, you know, they are extremely powerful. On the other side, on the regime, uh, uh, on the regime <coughs> uh, side, it's interesting. Unfortunately, you know, when you get a visa, you can go to Damascus. Uh, the regime forces you to, to, to be like a tourist. You can only go in some places of Damascus, like a cafe, restaurant, because you must show that, that uh, life is going on as usual, you know. And I think, honestly, journalists should refrain uh, uh, today to do that, because uh, the, the Palestinian camp I was talking about is eight kilometers, eight, from the center of Damascus. And they are starving, so probably journalists should tell the regime, hey, I don't want your visa if I cannot cover a place which is eight kilometers from your fancy restaurants. But anyway, what we know uh, is that there are foreign fighters also, you know, on the regime side, uh, mainly Iranian and Hezbollah fighters. So this is also an interesting thing, but unfortunately there's no coverage. So this is something that you, you don't find in the news, or I mean, don't find in the mainstream news. Um, when we say that, you know, rebels are uh, influenced by foreign fighters, there are radicals coming from abroad, it's the same for the regime. I mean, when Assad uh, says, uh, oh, but, you know, rebels without foreign support uh, cannot resist one day, it's true. If you close the border with Turkey, which is the border, you know, for, uh, for weapons, everything enters from Turkey, you know? So it's also funny, when we think of an external intervention, you, know, you remember in August, September, we were discussing this bomb, you know, and after the gas attack, you know? We already, there, there has been already an external intervention in Syria, because when you open a border, if tomorrow you close the border with Turkey, rebels are going to collapse in one week, really, in one week. So it's, if you want Assad to win, close the border with Turkey, and it's over. That's our external intervention, because the US, and not only the US, also, you know, uh, Saudi Arabia and Qatar, wants, are supporting the rebels, and that, you know, that border is open. So it's our external intervention. It's not true that you are, we are not acting, we are not doing anything in Syria. We are doing something. Um, on the other hand, on the regime side, it's the same. Assad cannot say that, you know, rebels uh, are still alive because they have foreign support, because foreign is the same. I can tell you the main problem, for example, for, for the regime, uh, the regime used a lot their force, not only because, you know, if you have a force and the other side has not even anti anti-aircraft weapon, it's better to you to use, you know, air force. Also because, you know, it's the same, for example, think of Americans uh, or Israelis. Uh, if, if you can avoid to use troops on the ground, you avoid it. And in the, for the regime especially, because they are afraid of defections, uh, all the defectors, you know, it's because they could see at some point uh, what was going on, you know, and so they defected. And so actually it's true that on the regime side you have the same numbers of fighters, but even from the regime side it's a minority of foreign fighters. So you have this curious thing, you have foreign fighters on both sides, Syrians are almost all outside the country, so Syrians are not more, no, no longer in Syria, and there are only foreign fighters on the ground. And I, for, now, for example, I can tell you I'm negotiating with rebels to enter, you know, to be smuggled in next days. Uh, I'm negotiating with the Saudis, uh, mostly with the fighters from Saudi Arabia. Uh, my, so I'm negotiating with fighters, not even one Syrian fighter, at least for now, from Saudi Arabia, from Tunisia, um, somebody from Chechnya, to avoid checkpoints, regime checkpoints, who are run uh, by Lebanese and Iranian fighters. <laughs> so, you know, it's, it's, I mean, it's weird. I'm going to Syria to cover a, a war where there are no more Syrians, if only Syrians are, the only role for Syrians is the role of the dead, or of the refugees.
two-part question. Uh, you the photographer who took this picture? Uh, no, not all of that. No. Pictures are really one of the most powerful pictures I've seen. Um, and to what do you think the rest of the world can do to help the situation in Syria? Or, think, or do you think they're doing the right? Right. Well, uh, of course, you know, I'm, I'm something I'm, you know, um, at this point, of course, it's difficult to do something. And that's why, for example, I'm, I'm uh, you know, I'm really upset for the way, uh, you know, uh, I mean, journalists are important because, for example, uh, the main gas attack happened in Oslo. No? Being on the ground, uh, we witnessed, the f witness, uh, one was witnessed by French journalists in April, uh, a gas attack uh, in April. The first one was in February. So, you know, months before the main attack. I, 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 you know, I usually think of this thing, you know, as a kind of symbol, you know. Uh, how many things, as a journalist on the ground, I saw before they became so entrenched, so serious, to become, I don't want to say intractable because we will find a solution at some point, no? But, you know, it's, it's really, uh, because then, you know, we are, as a pacifist, you know, as, a, as an activist also of the pacifist movement, you know, we are always, I don't know if, you know, probably being Norwegian, you know, you are quite pacifist, I guess, but, you know, we are always accused, okay, and now what do you do, no? Especially when somebody would want to use uh, force, like, you know, a humanitarian intervention, and you say, no, it's easy. So what we can do? So first of all, let's say that it's very easy, you know, it's, I mean, it's criminal to arrive to this point when, when you are seeing what's going on, you know, really before. I mean, for example, the first Al-Qaeda fighters, we saw them, personally, I saw them in October 2012. So, uh, when, when Al-Qaeda took control of the border was uh, September 2013, 11 months. 11 months is a lot of time to avoid that Al-Qaeda becomes what is now in Syria. It's a lot of time. So, in October 2012, you could stop, you know, this influx of foreign fighters, first of all. Um, that's just to remember, you know, that it's never too, I mean, so when, when, when we find yourself in such a difficult situation, you know, let's remember that we arrived <coughs> to this situation, it was our responsibility to arrive to this situation, first of all. Now, we are at this point, so, you know, let's, let's find a solution. Um, well, I think that today, you know, the main point we have to, to keep in mind, uh, we have two sides. We have the regime, uh, you know, we have Assad. Assad, mm -hmm. Assad in May or June, uh, there will be elections, presidential elections, uh, because the, his mandate expires. Can you imagine, you know, elections in such a situation, what kind of legitimacy, just a paper legitimacy can get? Uh, but we know, you know, it's, he will run, he will organize his elections, he will win, of course, elections. And um, it's also true, I mean, that Assad, uh, has support in Syria. So it's not true that he has no support at all, it's, it's true. Uh, then let's discuss why he's so supporting, because people, are, because people are supporting Assad or because people prefer Assad to Al-Qaeda. It's a different kind of support, I mean. Um, but so this is one side. We have Assad on, on one side. Um, on the other side, you have, when we say rebels, this is the real problem, you know, who are these rebels? You have fighters on the ground who are fighting each other. And uh, I can tell you, they cannot gather anything, anything. Not only, of course, Al-Qaeda, even the other fighters, because uh, when, when they liberated areas, they were unable to, you know, rebuild something, to, you know, to, do, to, to transfer power to some civilian authority, nothing. So they are unable, you cannot rely upon fighters for the future, for building the future. The problem is that they, then you have a, a civilian component of the opposition, which is called the Syrian National Coalition. This is the, it's based in Istanbul, and it's a, it's a kind of assembly. Uh, it's a kind of, you know, representative of, you know, Syrian population, selected, uh, you know, 
this should be the leaders, you know, the civilian leaders of Syrians. The point is that, you know, the idea at the beginning, when this Syrian national coalition was established, um, at the time there wasn't a war, we see the revolution, the idea was, let's do like in Libya, let's create a kind of government in exit, so the West will step in, you know, and let's, you know, exactly like in Libya. Then things, you know, uh, went in a different way. The problem with the Syrian national coalition is, is made up by Syrians who have been living abroad for uh, 20, 30 years, so they are completely detached from, you know. So, it makes no sense. I mean, when these are the guys who are in Geneva for ne negotiations, so even if, you know, uh, you have an agreement in Geneva, uh, what's the point having this agreement? So, I think that there is a preliminary step that we have to do as an international community. I mean, as a former mediator, I can tell you, uh, there is an important thing when you want to, to, you know, to have somebody at the table, you know, uh, you must have the right people at the table. <laughs> this is the first rule you know, of a good mediator. Of course, the goal of Geneva wasn't have an agreement, was to show to the international community that something was going on. Um, so, were well, fake negotiations. But the point is, we must find a way to uh, empower again uh, the civil society, which is incredibly active in Syria, because still today you have uh, civil society in Syria, in both, on both sides. Um, for example, still today, in this incredible situation, I mean, it's unbelievable, still today you have them peaceful demonstrations against the regime. You have, uh, because of course, you know, people are against both sides, so we must find these people who are against both the, the two regimes that you have to get today, and you must empower these groups uh, and try to, you know, uh, help them to network together. Most of them, unfortunately, this is the main problem of Syria, uh, are outside Syria, some of them are outside the best minds, of course, you know, now are scattered to Lebanon, especially in Lebanon, or maybe in Europe, maybe in the US, but, you know, they are ready to come back. They are ready. So we must rely upon these Syrians. We are dealing with the wrong Syrians, unfortunately. I think that the solution cannot be with, with the two parties we are, we are dealing with now. Because honestly, um, I cannot think of the rebels governing something, but I cannot even think that Assad can stay in power after all what happened. You know, I cannot believe it's unacceptable that you know, Assad stays in power. Then, you know, I think that as students, we all know of international relations, of politics, we all know that you have a president, and then, I mean, I come from Italy with fascism, uh, you have a, when you have a regime, it's not only a president. So if the problem is to save the regime in some way, because when an agreement is a compromise in such a situation, and after three years of war, it's clear that the regime didn't win, but also it's clear that the regime didn't lose the war, no? So if some regime members want to stay in power, unfortunately, unfortunately, they will stay in power because they didn't lose the war, no? But one thing is the regime, and one thing is Assad, and they think that Assad as a symbol must go. So you can, you know, uh, require that Assad go. This doesn't mean, that, you know, that you cannot, I mean, having Assad out still allow you to deal with some regime, you know, to strike a compromise with the regime. And so there is this distinction. I mean, uh, the, the, the mistake that we usually do is thinking of the both sides. I mean, this is something that happens in any negotiation, says uh, monolithic sides. When you say rebels, ask yourself who really are these rebels, you know. And, um, and when you see the picture, ask always yourself what's outside the picture. Because maybe who is outside the picture is the key guy. So I think there's a solution. The problem is, do we really want a solution? I don't think so. And I think, honestly, that at least for now, I, I, I don't agree, and not only for, uh, I mean, for ethical reasons, but also for strategic reasons, I don't agree with such a um, such way of thinking. But I think that, um, that our strategy as European, as Americans, uh, our strategy today is it's okay for us, the situation. It's in our interest, in, in our, I mean, our governments, because, um, I mean, 
been based in Ramallah, so I mean, uh, think never forget that in the Middle East there is Israel. So whatever you are doing, whatever you are thinking, ask yourself where Israel is, and you know, um, the, 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 the real the real issue with all the Arab Spring, you know, why we didn't know what to do with this strange thing called Arab Spring is that Israel, uh, for Israel, was unexpected, the Arab Spring. And, you know, we are, we are talking about Israeli borders. And I can tell you that, you know, uh, it's very clear, as I, I live in Ramallah, so on one side of the world. On the other hand, I have a Jewish ring in my finger. Um, you know, consider that, the, I don't know, maybe some of you have been in Palestine. Palestine, I mean, West Bank and Gaza Strip, uh, are very different from Lebanon, especially from Lebanon. And Lebanon is the real dangerous border for Syria, uh, for, for Israel. Um, and unfortunately, Syria is key for the Lebanese question, because, you know, it's to Syria that, uh, that has born in Lebanon, get weapons from Iran. So Syria is really, uh, Israel must think very well, uh, I mean, must think what to do. It's, uh, it can be dangerous what can happen you know, on the Lebanese border. Uh, uh, honestly, I've been living in Lebanon for one year. I understand now the fear of Israelis. Uh, I cannot say it's your psychology, no. It's an actual danger coming from Lebanon. Um, <coughs> and so at the beginning, you know, Especially the United States were thinking, okay, let's let's uh, Syrians can kill each other, you know, Lebanese, Iranians. It's you know, let's, it's, it's in our interest, you know, they will use the weapons against each other instead of focusing on. Uh, um, of course, now everything changed because now you have a private border with Turkey. I mean, the border of a NATO country, and it's not by chance that in. In June, Turkey was destabilized. You know, when what's happening in Turkey, for example, today is directly linked to. Uh, you know that Turkey, until a few years ago, a few months ago, was considered a kind of model of coexistence between Islam and democracy. Everybody was looking at Turkey with interest. And today, Turkey, you know, it's. Uh, well, uh, I've been living in Turkey in the last year. Um, there is a deep economic crisis caused by the Syrian refugees, massive influx of Syrian refugees. So, you know, we are destabilizing everything. Um, so this idea of, okay, they will fight each other, it's in our interest, now it doesn't work anymore. And then, uh, doesn't work anymore because there is one thing I can, I'm really scared of. Um, as you can imagine, um, I live in the Middle East, I have many, um, I mean, Islamist fighters and Islamists uh, in general are very different from what we expect. Um, still, there are radical fighters. Radical, uh, many of them are now uh, are now trained in Syria. Many European jihadists, and it's a matter of months they will come back to Europe and to the U.S. with these skills. And we, you cannot imagine how much hunger. And so I expect. Uh, Honestly, I expect uh, tough years for us in Europe. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, um, should we take just a brief uh, ten minutes? Just yeah. to, uh, yes. Okay. Yeah. I hope that you have thought well in these ten minutes on questions for Francesca because she is really uh, in a position that very few people on this earth uh, is. She's able to, uh, to, to answer these questions in, in uh, a manner that, uh, you know, you have uh, been the last, the last journalist leaving Syria. Um, as we saw, these shocking images. And your analysis that you started on at the end um, was very, uh, interesting, I think, because this is an extremely complex thing. Yes, no, sorry, I'm interrupting you. It's, I was thinking maybe, you know, I'm giving you long answers and probably 
they look like other questions in my answers, but it's, uh, it's something, you know, I think it's something uh, uh, not only intentional, I mean it's normal because it's, uh, uh, it's a complex issue, these two, but also at the end, and this is also something that I learned in Palestine, you know, uh, when I was, um, I was trained, you know, as a, as a mediator, and I was told, you know, that the conflict between Israelis and Palestinians uh, is the most complex one, also the one you should arrive at the end of your career, when you are really skilled, then you can deal, you know, with Israelis and Palestinians, and then, you know, living in Israel and Palestine, no, sorry, it's not complex at all, you know, uh, I mean, this doesn't mean it is black or white, it's question by question, you know, and piece by piece, fragment by fragment, you get the big picture, still is complex, uh, but it's not complicated. Uh, it's two different concepts. I mean, one thing is complexity, and one thing is time, and one, one thing is, you know, something complicated. <coughs> it's simply complex, you know, so many factors, uh, you know, overlapping in terms of K, like, like in Syria, you know. Um, but in the end, it's not complicated if you use uh, our, I mean, our, our mind. And that's why every answer should open new questions, so don't, don't be afraid, you know, if you think it's. It's uh, like a chain, you know, and every question, new question, it's a good, uh, I think it's good answers, open, you know, good questions. So it's the questions can relate to the Balkans and the, uh, the Palestine Israel questions as well, because you have been there. Yeah. So. Uh, well, okay, first, uh, first woman. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I wonder how, um, what do you see the biggest uh, as the biggest difference between the conflict in Syria and, let's say, the other conflicts where you've been, and uh, what's the biggest problem with that difference? Um, it's, uh, no, any, any conflict, you know, is, uh, is unique in some way. I think the, um, uh, the problem in Syria is um, what I told you before, you know, we are paying the price of, um, of uh, Israel's, uh, you know, perplexity uh, in front of the Arab Spring. And consider that, for example, as a journalist, I have to be very, very curious to cover and uncover the issue. I mean, Israel is, um, um, is uh, targeting uh, unknown locations inside Syria, even if this is something that we don't read the newspapers. Uh, since the beginning. Sometimes there are, the last one, uh, one week ago, if I remember well, sometimes there are airstrikes inside Syria, uh, so Israel is doing something. Uh, we think that it's bombing um, weapons. Uh, and the problem is, yes, um, it, the problem with Syria is you don't know, you know, who should replace, uh, who should replace, uh, and the problem in Syria is, is that, you know, it's clear that there are no good guys and bad guys, but I think that if you, you know, the real problem is also that Syria looks different probably from other conflicts and more intractable, also because we forget to go back when a war is over. So if you, if you go to Bosnia today, no, uh, Bosnia is a, uh, Okay, they are not killing each other anymore, um, but it's a failing state. And not only a failing state, I'm not worried about failing states, honestly, I'm most worried about failing societies. Um, <coughs> if you go back today and you look at Iraq, look at Libya, look at Afghanistan, you know, so um, each of these countries, you know, and the point is that we are used to think in terms of good guys and bad guys, and this is our main mistake. Um, there are not good guys. Uh, never. That's, that's all. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I was wondering, as a journalist, how you get treated by the average man in the street? How they look at? Right? Um, this, is a, this is a good question because you know that in one of the reasons why there are no journalists staying longer in Syria is because of kidnapping. Um, we are getting kidnapped. Uh, there are, um, we don't have official figures because some of the kidnappings are not public. 
uh, more than you can imagine. Um, again, uh, my job is making questions, and so let's ask ourselves if we have some responsibility in this situation. Um, because actually, at the beginning, uh, when the, when it was a revolution, we were welcomed as journalists. Now, you can say it's an easy answer. Of course, because you were in some way on the side of the rebels. You know, there was Egypt, there was Libya, everything, and we were there to cover the revolution. Also, of course, you were welcome. Uh, it's only part of the truth, uh, because we started to, kidnapping started before the, the revolution became this mess that it's today, you know. And so it's also our responsibility. I mean, today we are not welcome at all. I can also tell you that as an average, uh, rule, not only Syria, so and not only now. Uh, we are not welcome at all where we go. Um, but this happens also, you know, wherever you go, even in Italy, I mean, journalists are not welcome at all. Uh, journalists are used to say, you know, I'm new to journalism, I started journalism two years ago. Journalists are used to say, um, oh, it's a good sign, you know, when we are not welcome. If you are welcome as a journalist, you are not a good journalist. Again, it's part of the truth. I can understand what you mean. Uh, it's also a very stupid answer in some way, uh, because um, if you are getting killed and kidnapped, probably there is something wrong. And um, I mean, what journalists are doing? Consider that uh, I don't think that journalists can change the world, and I'm not in Syria or around the Middle East to change the world or something. I don't think I'm so powerful, but, but um, I feel responsible because I know that on the basis of the picture that I'm providing you who cannot be in Syria, you and all the governments, all the secret services, all, the, you know, all these kind of people, on the basis of my picture and the picture of intelligence, of the intelligence units who are on the ground, uh, is on the basis of this picture that the United States or Russia or uh, you know uh, the UK are going to decide what to do and what not to do. And when we consider what they are doing, again, <coughs> remind that even opening or, close, or closing a border is a huge action in a war, no? Uh, it's on the basis of my picture, so I feel this kind of responsibility. Unfortunately, let's say that the majority of journalists doesn't feel at all this kind of responsibility, and just uh, it's focused on their own career, and it's focused on these terribly awards that we have. Uh, again, I'm new to journalism, so I discovered this world of journalism awards. Seems that our goal is to get one of these damn awards, so our year, working year from January to December, is, you know, the timeline is the, the deadline of the main awards, so, you know, if you check uh, the news, you will see that some events are covered and some events are not on the basis of, you know, the kind of events that you should cover to win some awards. So, I mean, when the deadline for the World Press photo is closed, uh, suddenly <laughs> some words disappear from the radar, which is, I mean, this is something that Syrians noticed. Syrians noticed that all the photographers disappear suddenly. Not when kidnaps and stuff, but when the World Press photo awarded all photographers on Syria. Why? Because in 2013, WordPress photo was on words, and everybody knew all photographers that in 2014, uh, the WordPress photo, uh, you know, two following years, uh, you know, it's uh, it actually one, one, two weeks ago, three weeks ago, the new winners, there are no war, no, no war photographers, almost nobody, you know, they knew. Uh, and so, why to cover words? Why to cover Syria again? I'm not going to win again in Syria, you know? I can tell you I'm a writer, so now that I finish my book, the question is the other journalist questions. But, you know, you, probably, you finish your books, why do you have to go back? Uh, unfortunately, you know, the point is not the book is finished. My po the point is the war is finished or is not finished? That's all. So when, you know, a place becomes dangerous, sometimes we uh, make it dangerous. Enemy would be prone to do, but um, 
to me it was a little unclear in what, how much of these tactics do, um, let's say, Western forces, let's say US and NATO and uh, those factions, how, in what degree do they use these uh, tactics? No, it's, uh, I have to admit uh, I have no sympathy at all, as you can imagine, for uh, US wars and our wars. Uh, simply, let's say, there are no less criminal wars. Uh, it's a matter of technology. So the kind of technology that you use affects the kind of crimes that you commit. Um, so, I mean, uh, no, it's different because it's, uh, in any case, uh, well, first of all, there is a big difference uh, on the ground uh, between uh, trained forces like special forces, Western, I, I'm thinking, speaking of Western forces, and uh, US soldiers, average soldiers, because the average soldier is an 18 year old, 19 year old guy with the weapons in his hands. And it's something that you know better not to not to be in the in the high side of his of his weapon. Um, is not um, is not trained enough, especially psychologically. It's the you know the happy happy trigger. Um, uh, but you know then you have elite forces and uh, um, think of Israeli forces. Israeli forces, okay. It's um, think only you know in um, professional under a professional point of view. Then there is the Anyway, they are well trained. Um, and the point is, you know, depending on the technology that you are using, you commit some kind of crimes because it's, uh, uh, it's uh, I mean, um, no, it's a, it's a different kind of world. You don't target civilians in this way. You target civilians in another way. Uh, I mean, because you think that you can have a surgical attack while there are no surgical attacks. I mean, when Israelis uses their um, uses airstrikes on Gaza, no? Gaza is so densely packed with people that there's no such thing as a surgical airstrike on Gaza. It's impossible to, you know, hit only, only fighters, only Hamas fighters. It's, uh, there's no way. I mean, and, and in any case, Israel in Gaza, you know, there's the siege of Gaza, it's targeting civilians. <coughs> The point is that, you know, as a general view today, you, you, your target is civilians because your idea is that you have to, you know, uh, in the end, it's civilians who decide, you know, the government, we live in democracy, more or less, you know, and um, so in the end, you target civilians because you, you think that the assault things that, you know, if you target the, the civilians, they will... Um, they won't support rebels, and the opposite. Rebels think, you know, that if they target civilians, it's, it's uh, civilians are the main target. Uh, simply, I think that Western powers call civilians collateral damage. Uh, so that's that's the difference, you know, and uh, they don't target them intentionally, but the the weapons that are used and the way. You know, the cities have been in the countries where they use their weapons, and the only effect is the same. And I mean, in, again, in Pakistan, the drone wars officially they are targeting, uh, they are targeting uh, Al Qaeda, Al Qaeda leaders. And look at the figures, uh, it's uh, thousands of dead, it's more or less 3,000. I don't remember actually, I checked uh, less than 5,000, but anyway, between 3,000 and 5,000. Victims, you know, of. so there's anyway. The, the real point is that with weapons, you don't achieve anything. This is, the, I mean, collateral damage or not, the point is that you don't achieve anything, anything, never. Um, it's been said that you were the last journalist to leave. Um, what kind of coverage is there now? Is there anything at all? There's no coverage. No coverage. Right. No coverage means that we use um, we use uh, what we call citizen journalist. Um, would you ever go to a citizen dentist? Don't think so. Would you ever allow a citizen engineer to build a bridge? Don't think so. 
that's a citizen journalist. I mean, we are calling, uh, I'm grateful to Syrians who are providing emails, and especially in this situation where you know there are no journalists, no foreign journalists on the ground. Um, very grateful to what they are doing, and they are paying uh, most of them a uh, price for what they are doing. So, uh, really grateful to what they are doing. But journalism is another thing. The journalism is the key thing in journalism is distance. You know, you must be at the right distance. There must be the right distance between you and the story. Because any journalist knows that sometimes you are too close, and sometimes you are too far, of course, and you don't understand anything. But most of the times, the problem is that you are too involved. Especially who's been covering Palestine knows that. At some point, you have to leave because you are so involved that you don't see anymore some elements that you must show to your readers. And this is a distance that, by definition, a citizen journalist doesn't have. Because what is a citizen journalist, if you think of it? Is the guy who is walking with his dog, uh, you know, close next to the Twin Towers on September 11, and uh, shoot a photo, you know, with okay, there wasn't there were the iPhones, but with something like that, and it's a witness. Would you would you ask uh, to this guy an analysis of Al Qaeda, you know, and would you ask him advice uh, about you know uh, invading Afghanistan or not? I don't think so. It's just a witness. It's not a citizen journalist. On the, other, on the other hand, uh, then you have also guys who are covering events day by day, what they are doing in Syria, you know, or we have, an, we have a word for those guys, activists, and they are showing us what they want to show us, you know. So um, it's not journalism. I mean, they, they, they do their job, they are activists. Uh, they are not showing you the two regimes. They are showing you only one, one thing, I mean, only that's why we need journalists, and that's why even if when we, when we rely upon citizens, so-called citizen journalists, we don't have news, we don't have coverage. And uh, just to give you, you know, an example of the consequences of... Uh, we rely upon citizen journalists also because, you know, it's very cheap for newspapers to get, you know, something from Facebook instead of paying an envoy. Um, uh, when there was the chemical attack in August, John Kerry uh, went to the Congress, you know, to explain the situation. They were deciding to, you know, what to do, and he, he quoted an analysis published by the Wall Street Journal. Journal, so not, you know, not an Italian journalist, not, you know, an, an analysis on the Wall Street Journal. It was an analysis on rebels. Um, if you was translated in so many, so many countries, and this. Uh, this article was a reportage on the, from the front line, not from rebel, rebel groups. It was a kind of overview of rebel groups. Uh, if you read this, this, this reportage, uh, the idea that you get is that rebels are really good guys. Because, you know, the problem for the US was, okay, if we bomb, who is going to replace Assad? Can we trust these rebels? This was the debate, no? So if you read this reportage, uh, you arrive at the conclusion that, yes, we can trust them. They are really good guys, and these Al-Qaeda fighters, no, no worry, it's a minority. End of August, beginning of September, I entered Syria after two weeks, and there was, you know, Al-Qaeda. Uh, then, um, who was the author of this, of this reportage quoted by, you know, John Kerry, and the reportage, the basis for US policy in Syria, uh, 26 years old, uh, recently graduated uh, in, uh, you know, uh, she worked for an um, American US think tank, and then um, journalists discovered that she was on the payroll of a Syrian lobby that were trying to push the US toward intervention. So, uh, an analysis written by a 26 year old who started to deal with the Middle East two years ago becomes the basis of US policy in Syria when journalists are not on the ground and we rely upon citizen journalists. It's not only so you know that then you don't have coverage of Syria. The next question is, if I, I don't have coverage of Syria, what happens to peace and war in Syria? Because in the end, you know, I don't care if it's our coverage is not, again, it's not something without any other, I mean, we are responsible, so we must, if there is no coverage of Syria, or there is such bad coverage, the consequence is uh, terrible policies.
Is there any possibility for unbiased reporting of the war? Uh, in the uh, no, there's year? there's no possibility of unbiased writing at all. I mean, you know, no, this is something that you know. It's um, um, I'm a writer. I, I wrote two books, and now this third one. So I have a literary way of writing. I often use the uh, first person uh, for a precise choice. Um, so I'm, I didn't come. I don't come from a journalism school. Uh, I'm an outsider, and so I'm uh, usually accused by other journalists, you know, to be a writer and not a journalist, and blah blah blah, not to be objective. Um, unfortunately, it's true that I didn't study journalism, but I studied philosophy. Uh, I mean, uh, so who is still believing that, you know, there is such thing like objectivity in our life and in our perception of things? I think that at least after Kant, so it's not something that, you know, more or less we, we all study Kant, you know. So is still somebody believing in su such thing like an objective truth? I don't think so, except for journalists probably, who think that if you, for example, I'm usually accused by other journalists, they say, oh, you are, you, are, you are an activist because you usually say the Assad regime is not a regime. If you are objective, you should say the government of Bashar al-Assad. Unfortunately, you know, uh, international law, according to international law, the government of Bashar al-Assad is a regime. So it's not, you know, it's, it's international law. Can you imagine, you know, in the... In, in, the th in, in the 40s, somebody says the government of Adolf Hitler. You know, I, I, I'm trying to you know uh, in 20 years what people would say about what I'm writing. You know, I can say today, now, that it's a regime. Of course, international law says now, today, that it's a regime. It's not my perception. And the point is, you know, uh, there's no such thing like unbiased covering or cover. The point is that you must be honest and tell, you know, the, the reader, make the reader understand where you are, more or less. This doesn't mean that I'm supporting rebels or I'm supporting, you know, the regime. Uh, it's not what I mean for, uh, you know, bias, of course, it's, uh, you know. And again, I can also tell you it's very easy not to take side in such a situation. So uh, when, when, some, when sometimes I'm asked, but how can you be, you know, uh, in the end, you support somebody. No, it's very easy not to support anybody, honestly. Um, but again, it's it's always your way of viewing something, and you must remember readers that what they are reader. At least this is my point of view. You must remember them that it's only my point of view. Even if you know it looks something like an objective uh, reportage, no, it's still what I decided to cover. Because when I decided to cover something, you have never been here, you must trust me. I decided at the same time not to cover something else. So even if I give you a great objective, you know, reportage according to British standard, you know, great, and we can get, uh, we can use it for a dissertation in journalism um, about, I don't know, rebels. I'm deciding to cover the front line and not to cover the activists who are peacefully demonstrating against the regime, which was our main mistake as journalists. No? and what Syrians are accusing us of doing. You know, say, it became a war because you covered the front line and you didn't cover civil society because technically covering the front line is easier than covering the civil society. It's true. Uh, so it's, they are right when they, they tell us you know, that was our responsibility. So you, know, you read my reportage, you think, oh, great objective reportage. You don't know what I decided not to tell you. Decided because I decided intentionally, decided because I was unable to cover other things. That's why, for example, I'm, I'm, my book is not on Syria, it's on Aleppo. And when other journalists say, you know, but what's the point? Is they, they think that maybe you are, you know, uh, it's something that your work looks less important because it's only a fragment of the world. It's not even on Aleppo, it's a paragraph. <coughs> where I explain, hey guys, it's not even of Aleppo, it's on one half of Aleppo, rebel type Aleppo. Because the regime had Aleppo, there is a, a, a street between the two sides, under mortar fire and under snipers, and you cannot cross. I mean, I covered the street many times. The point is that if you cross, then there are regime checkpoints, and you ask IDs, what can I do if I'm stopped? Uh, I will be arrested immediately. So I've never been in regime held Aleppo, 
and I cannot tell you if it's when I can rely only upon you know the same information that you can get uh, on the other side of Aleppo. I mean, there are photos that show restaurants and cafe, and everything is usual in Aleppo is unbelievable. And other activists that tell you know that no, that there is war even in the other side of Aleppo. We will never see. We will never know the truth because there are no journalists on the other side. So I prefer to tell you, hey, this is not a book on Syria. This is a book. Look on a small fragment of Syria, because I think that if I tell you the truth, you know, if I tell you, it's not something that, okay, my work is less important because it's such a small fragment of the world. I think it becomes even more interesting because it allows you to understand what the war really is and what the coverage of the war really is, because if you think that I'm a journalist covering Syria, there is no journalist who can say I'm covering Syria. When you when you listen to one of these awarded journalists saying, I've been covering Syria, you, are, you have been covering Syria, first of all, you cannot, be co you cannot have been covering the two sides. So first of all, specify what sides have you been covering, no? because you have to choose. And so, of course, my perception of the world is biased by the first choice that I have to do. Where to go? Rebbehad is Syria or regime in Syria? I cannot do both. So, no? But did you know all this? No. Did you know? Because journalist says, I'm covering Syria. So who is more objective? Who is more objective? The journalist who is using the first person or the journalist who is using the third person and who is writing uh, the government of Bashar al-Assad? Mm. So pay attention with objectivities. It's the best way to be, you know, the best way is to be biased is, is he say I'm objective. This is something I mean any philosophy student, sorry, I don't know why journalists that don't like philosophy, but you know. Okay. Uh, yeah. So four years ago nobody expected such a disaster in uh, Syria. What do you see? Where do you see the most possible future conflicts? Uh, and uh, is it Thailand, Turkey, or Bangladesh, or I don't know, no. Middle Asia, or uh, do you think it's too late, or maybe we can do something? Late in Syria? Or yeah, generally, in the world. Not no, we, we can always do something. Yeah. We can always do something. Um, this is definitely something not true when, when, when you know, you have told it's too late, uh, so let's bomb. Especially because when you bomb something, you know, Think of Kosovo, you know, still today, it's, it's, you think, oh, it's humanitarian intervention, you know, it's, uh, think of the Balkans today, they're not society, or uh, uh, think of Lebanon, Lebanon is really a non-society after 15 years of wars. Uh, no, you know, the, the main wars coming. Um, the problem is, you know, how many things we do know. For example, the reason why Ukraine is so over-covered today, you know, today as a journalist, you know, if I must choose where to go, uh, following the headlines, there is a Central African Republic, South Sudan, Ukraine. Um, somebody is going to Venezuela. These are the four uh, crises we are more or less covering. Uh, then, in two months, we will all move to Egypt because there are presidential elections in Egypt. Um, well, Ukraine is, uh, I don't know if Ukraine, for example, is more important than Central African Republic. Um, I've never been, you know, in both countries. Uh, I want to go in both in next, next weeks. Uh, the point is that, uh, I can tell you, Ukraine is very cheap. You don't need a visa to go to Ukraine. It's uh, more or less 100 euros a flight to Kiev. Um, and it's very easy to find something, uh, you know, to write something about, even if you don't know anything about uh, uh, Russia, Soviet Union, you can find something to write. For a photographer, it's great because you have, you know, snow and fires, and it's great. Central African Republic is a little bit more expensive, terribly expensive. It's very difficult to get a visa. Um, and that's why, you know, we think probably that Ukraine is terribly, you know, more important than Central African Republic. There are also these dynamics, you know, uh, below the surface of news coverage that, that honestly, before turning to journalism, I didn't know. So I don't know if maybe, you know, there is something more important if I think with the mind of a political scientist, you know, in the long run, 
um, if there is something more important going on, I don't know, in Libya or in Lebanon or in Iraq today, no? I don't know because all journalists are in Ukraine because it's cheaper and there is no desert policy. But do you think what's happening in Turkey could bring to a big conflict? Or not? Well, in, in Turkey, yes, I mean, because the idea that Turkey was, you know, uh, under this strong economic development and was a uh, now we start to see Turkey, you know, in a little bit different way, you know. It's, uh, now we discover that it's still uh, quite an authoritarian state. And so, I mean, Turkey is, a, is an important country for us. It's very important if Turkey finds a balance between being a Muslim observant country, I mean, society, and being a secular uh, state. And seems they are a little bit in trouble. Um, but again, you know, economic and social issues are very important because the real issue in, in Turkey now is also an economic, an economic issue. Um, consider that the uh, Turkish lira lost 50% of its value in uh, six months. It's, uh, it's a lot for, uh, for a country. So, no, there are, honestly, the real undercover topic if I have to choose one, is the economic crisis in Europe of my generation, of Southern Europe. That's a huge, huge problem. Yeah. And that, you know, uh, also, that still is not becoming, you know, an open revolution because we have our family welfare in, in Southern Europe. But we have, you know, um, when you have 40%, like in Italy, 42% of unofficial unemployment, which means that the real unemployment it's dramatic um, and you have a lost generation and things are going to worsen I expect something uh, something in Europe not not only you know in far away countries so um, has the situation in between the rebels that support um, Al-Qaeda and wants the Sharia and the one who the, the secular rebels? Yes. Um, let's say that um, uh, the majority of rebels uh, want Sharia law. Uh, there are um, secular rebels are now a minority because the secular groups um, simply fled away. Now they are refugees somewhere in some other countries, majority of them. At the beginning, secular rebels were the majority, of course. Um, but uh, when you say that now the majority of rebels want the Sharia law, you know, what's the meaning of Sharia law? Let's first, let's agree about, you know, what do you mean for Sharia law? So they don't agree each other. Uh, so there is, there is, they don't have a, a unitary vision of what Sharia law is. So if you uh, talk with the majority of them, it's nothing special, this Sharia law. It's something like the Sharia law that you have in Egypt, or you have you know, uh, somewhere else. Um, if, you, if, you, if you talk, it's impossible to talk, I mean, but in, uh, what we know about these al Qaeda <coughs> groups, about their, their interpretation of Sharia law, of course, it's an interpretation. Islam is always, a, like all religions, so it's always a matter of interpretation. So the point is never. Uh, you know, a distinction between uh, who wants Sharia law and who doesn't want Sharia law. The point is always ask ourselves or, or ask them, honestly, what do you mean for Sharia law? Uh, this is something, you know, for example, in, uh, even in Palestine, you know that Sharia and the Palestinian constitution, uh, it's, uh, there is Sharia in Palestine. You would never say that there is Sharia law in Palestine. You would even notice it. And it was the same, for example, in Egypt. In Egypt, uh, I think that one of the worst, worst mistake, recent mistake of the West in Egypt was the overthrow of the Muslim Brotherhood government. It was really a huge mistake. And was uh, you know, uh, something clearly driven from abroad. And I have many, many friends in the Muslim Brotherhood. And again, you have a minority uh, of radicals. This doesn't mean uh, Al-Qaeda-like, not at all. Uh, Egypt is very moderate was an interest for the majority. There is a reformist wing, for example, within the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt. Um, they had an interesting, interesting, interesting view of the Sharia law. Something, uh, you know that Sharia, uh, for, um, 
for a lawyer. Um, it's fascinating in some way. It's, uh, they have a long history. I mean, it's uh, uh, what we now call Sharia law. It's something that has been completely changed by the impact of colonialism, and so by uh, by the let's say the overlapping of Western elements of of law uh, and the original uh, Islamic law. So today you have, you know, um, something of a, a mix, you know, um, and you know, I, this is a, a technical an issue, but it's, it's really interesting. The Sharia is based on the role of the, not on the role of the judge, like the common law, but on the role of the, let's say, the expert of jurisprudence, you know, an expert of law. And so let's say that, so it's very similar to common law in some sense, especially I come from a civil law, I mean, Romanistic country like Italy, you know, based on Roman law, civil law, and based on the code, you know? So uh, for me, it's, it's a really strange common law. Um, I don't know if you are familiar, you know, with this distinction. The point is that um, it depends also, you know, the difference between common law, so the judge, Sharia law, the expert, and uh, Romanistic law, civil law, I mean, uh, the state. It depends, you know, on the relationship between civil society, state. It's, it's really, you know, the, the law system that you adopt really says a lot about your way of living. So the point is, I don't want to be so long, you know, on such a complex issue, but the point is, just one parenthesis, if you want to be a journalist, you know, that's why you must study also something else, because otherwise you don't know anything, you don't understand anything. It's really complex, you know, but it's uh, usually, you know, the best, uh, one of the best sellers among journalists is the history of Kalashnikov, that I'm currently reading now. It's very boring, it's a best seller among all journalists. Can you imagine, you know, journalists, they are trying to explain you what's happening in the Middle East. They don't know the difference between common law and civil law, but they know the history of Kalashnikov. So, the point is, uh, the, the original Sharia law is based on this role, of, on this, on this man, you know, was the expert in the community. And the problem is that uh, you must trust this man. So today you have still, just to be, brief, to be short, you have still a Sharia law based on the experts, no? So Sharia law is still today when you, when you, in Aleppo, when you enter the Sharia court, you know, you find three men who are the experts of the law, and they say, this is the law. The point is that these men are, non -exper are not experts and are not trusted by their community because there is no community behind them. So you are imposing, you know, a system that cannot work because you are, you are, you know, you are using only some parts of the system. Uh, you are, uh, keeping the, the role of the expert, but there is, there is no background for this expert, you know, and this becomes not, you know, he's no more an expert, he's a, he's a man who is using the Quran to impose his own will. So that's why when we speak about Sharia law, we must first try to understand, okay, but what do you mean for Sharia law? And then let's ask ourselves, is your society structured in such a way that Sharia law can be implemented because Sharia law cannot work in a cannot work in, in, in a Western uh, system. I mean, that's why it's a little bit complicated, and that's why in the end you have you know authoritarian views. Yeah. Anyway, if, if, honestly, personally, if you could avoid to use you know something like a Bible or a Quran you know, to rule about, especially because, you know, and now I'm, uh, I want to be honest, I'm a little bit tired of the religion, the religion starts to be too heavy for me in the Middle East in the last months. Um, because, you know, a society is not only relationship between man and woman, it's about, uh, you know, weddings, about, uh, it's only, I mean, if we have to think of the future of Syria, uh, rebuilding a state or governing a state of Egypt, you know, it's also about, uh, about, I mean, economy, about everything. Can we rely upon, you know, the Quran, or the Bible, to run today? I mean, the main problem in Egypt mm -hmm. is unemployment. 80 million people, 100 million people, you know, don't have exact views of the population. Terrible level of unemployment, you know. When we 
uh, when we design the new uh, law of Egypt, the new constitution, you know, can we also focus on serious issues, you know, like unemployment, like how to how to be the better society on an economic and social point of view, or we must talk all around the clock about you know the role of women, about you know that's the point. That's why a little bit of secularism, honestly, a little bit you know. Um, now in the Middle East, you must justify everything about uh, you know elite religion. <coughs> something, but something is forbidden, something is allowed. It's too much. It's too much. Uh, I wonder what do you think is uh, the best case and the worst case scenario, like in the future for Syria. No, unfortunately, I see only one scenario. Uh, whatever uh, we will do, uh, whatever we will do in the future, Syria will become like Lebanon. I mean, at some point, uh, not soon. At some point, the war will finish. Will finish. You know, this war finish. Because you are exhausted, because both sides at some point are. I think that even is between Israelis and Palestinians, we will finish in this way. Mm -hmm. um, it will take years, for sure, one, one year, two years for sure, I mean, and maybe more. It becomes, it will become like Lebanon. Lebanon is, uh, is one of, it's probably the worst place where I've been living, even if it's, it's great. It's the worst place not only because there is a person, there is a huge gap between the poor and the rich. And it's very difficult for me to, to, to live in such a country when you have a small downtown Beirut with all the money, oil money of Saudi Arabia, and then this huge mass of poor, and then the rich are Sunnis and the poor are Shias. And so then you understand why there is such religious conflict. It's not a religious conflict, it's a, you cannot have you know, two thirds of the city without electricity and water and uh, and one percent in Ferrari cannot work. It's not a matter of religion, unfortunately. This cannot work. I mean, uh, of course, then you, you have a war. And uh, Lebanon is not a society because you know they live next to each other. But they, it's, it's funny. It's the, it's the only country I think. It's when you when you get on board a plane uh, to, to Beirut, uh, the, the, if you ask uh, the, the the guy who's sitting next to you, uh, where are you from? He will tell you um, I'm Armenian. If somebody tells you, says you I'm Armenian, you imagine that he comes from Armenia, no? Because we are normal people. If you tell me I'm Norwegian, I guess that you, you come from Norwegian, no? Um, no, they say that they mean that they are. He's a, it means that he's Lebanese of Armenian uh, descent. And so first they are group, ethnic group or religious group or whatever, and then. The Lebanese identity is not a society. This is what will happen to Syria. Not because there are so many ethnic groups, but because it won't be a society again. Yeah, at least uh, not in the next twenty years. Yeah. Yeah, it's clear that the, a lot of area and opposite side is in the hand of terrorists, Al Qaeda, and extremist Muslims. They're not Syrian groups. They're coming from Taliban, from Afghanistan, Pakistan, <coughs> extremist Muslims from Europe, also from Norway, from USA, and other Arabic countries, also yeah. in Turkey. And uh, they are going there and they are fighting with Assad, and they are killing the people, and they are they are cutting the people's head, and they don't they don't want to Christians, Alawi groups, and Shia. I think Assad has doesn't uh, that doesn't have any choice to, to fight with them, and he has to fight with them. And now there is a uh, Syrian groups are minority. It's right that now they are joining with Assad and they are fighting against Al Qaeda. And the pro the point is this that this Al Qaeda group is using people houses to fight with regime, and uh, I think. This uh, Syria really uh, problem is just uh, an indirect fighting or war between super messy countries, right? USA or Russia. If you compare Syria with Saudi Arabia, Saudi Arabia is controlling with a very dangerous dictatorial region. There is no human rights, no rights for for women. But in Saudi Arabia, there is an American military base. 
Oh, okay, that's okay, because you're my friend, you can do everything that you want. But Syria region is very close with Iran and Russia. Therefore, USA and European countries supporting the Al-Qaeda groups, the terrorists. And this was just a little comment. And oh, this, yes. sorry, this is the things that you're not talking in the Western media. No, no, yes, the, 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 the terrorists that they went from airports. Uh, definitely true, just one, one thing. When we, uh, let's remember that each of us, each of us, I mean, our com countries is using Al Qaeda. So Al Qaeda is a, yes. it's a strange, strange, again, probably each time we should ask ourselves what we are, uh, what was the meaning of Al Qaeda, you know, because we know that it's a strange organization. And, but you know, let's remember. So the United States used at the time, you know, the Taliban to find uh, to, to fight the Soviet. Uh, then you know, today, for example, in Syria, um, Assad used Al Qaeda because, of course, uh, he never targeted Al Qaeda, and so uh, was you know, it's a great, it's the best enemy that he can have because now that he has Al Qaeda on the other side, imagine that you know, uh, if Assad. Uh, has on the other side these young, peaceful demonstrators, you know. Uh, that's a much powerful uh, enemy for Assad, you know, uh, young, peaceful demonstrators. Then probably, as you said, Syria, you know, geopolitically, then probably in any case there's no solution. But uh, of course it's a great enemy, uh, Al-Qaeda is a great enemy for, for Assad, because now we can say, look, they are all terrorists, can I, you know, give the country to terrorists, so it's, uh, that's why he never targeted. So everybody is uh, using, uh, using Al-Qaeda, and it's curious because, you know, uh, the reason why Al-Qaeda is so, um, it's so easy in Syrian territory, and they, they are such good fighters, is because they were allowed to use Syrian territory as a base uh, when they were fighting in Iraq against, uh, against the Americans, so Assad, you know, to push, to to keep pressure on the Americans, on the US, allow Al-Qaeda to use Syria as a base. So they, they were trained in Syria and then they went to fight Americans in Iraq. So I mean, everybody, so, so Assad, you know, used Al-Qaeda a few years ago against, against the US in Iraq, and now it's, uh, you know, it's, it's uh, so, it's, uh, and now it's, so he supported Al-Qaeda a few years ago, and now it's against Al-Qaeda, it's, uh, uh, that's that's you know um, that's why you are two in the end uh, Syrians are really trapped between you know it's, it's a matter of geopolitics and as you said of course you know uh, when you think you know, it's it's uh, it's weird that you know the right the rebels let's say the uh, Syrian revolution whatever is left of the Syrian revolution is backed by Saudi Arabia can we really imagine that you know the champion of democracy in the Middle East or at least in Syria is Saudi Arabia. You know, so Saudi Arabia is supporting democracy in Syria. Come on, you know, look at your uh, at your home. You know, so how can Saudi Arabia or Qatar? But this is you know, so they are championing democracy in Syria, and Saudi Arabia sent its troops immediately to Bahrain to you know uh, for a crackdown on the Bahrain Spring. So of course you know it's a matter of it's more complicated than uh, there's the. I mean, demonstrators are not the only players, of course, on the ground. Yeah. Yes. In relation to that, uh, you mentioned that you, you had fears for the future of all the people. Well, there has been many Norwegians, as well as uh, from other nationalities, going to Syria yeah. to, to uh, uh, fight. And when, when these people come back yeah. to Norway and other countries, um, you mentioned that there will be a significant threat or possible threat of seas for, for instance, <coughs> terrorist attacks. Uh, or, or should I interpret this differently? Is that what you meant? Yes, because honestly, the amount of hunger that you bring home with you when you experience war is something unbelievable. Consider that I'm a journalist and so I'm not a fighter. And moreover, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm quite a pacifist, so you know, I shouldn't be so affected. 
by you know violence and and uh, three days ago when I was in the Hague in the International Criminal Court, no, I was there for a reportage and I was listening to a hearing. Um, there was a witness. It was about Kenya. I don't even know the case. What they were discussing, you know. Um, it was about Kenya, and there was a witness in the in the courtroom. Um, and so, you know, it's normal trial. So the uh, the defense lawyer, uh, the, the prosecutor asked, you know, I think the witness asked for a kind of protection, uh, so asked for anonymity, and then. The, uh, then the defense lawyer for no, you know, the, the witness is not really in danger. So, I mean, something normal in the trial. The defense lawyer was doing his job, nothing, uh, nothing more, honestly. But, you know how lawyers are, you know, during trials, they are very aggressive, you know, and with their words and very... And so he was accusing the witness who was there. Um, and they, he was accusing the witness of lying, saying, oh, the real reason is said because you are... Uh, you are afraid of showing your face and that, and you want to, you know, you want to, you want anonymity is because you, you don't want to know, uh, you want, don't want to, you, you don't want that your neighbors and relatives and friends to know that you are lying to the court and you are, you know, he was accusing directly the witness and, uh, you know, it's a minor uh, thing, it's something normal in a trial, but since this trial concerns, you know, genocide, crimes against humanity, such big things, you know, I was so, I felt so oppressed because I could imagine what the witness was, you know, feeling the moment. My idea was, okay, now I will, you know, I, I can really attack the defense lawyer, you know, you could really, really physically, you can attack him because you say, okay, guys, okay. It's the, the, the amount, you know, of the feelings are so exasperated when you live, you know, in a war for the injustice that you you have witnessed as a journalist, or you know, that you think has been committed if you are a fighter. And I can imagine, you know, when these fighters will come back and will find themselves in a society, you know, when whatever they will be seeing, you know, will appear to them like I mean it's really something it's really something dangerous. And and as we all know, today you don't need a, a nuclear weapon to carry, carry out you know, a dangerous attack. You can do whatever, you know, you can use whatever, and so there's no real way to track these, these fighters and to prevent, to prevent attacks. So they will come back home with a terrible amount of hunger, uh, in, you know. And then the few fighters that I met, they are already, uh, I mean, uh, they, are, they are already excluded, you know, they are at the margins of our society. So we are not speaking of, you know, uh, people who have a job here, who have a family, who have, you know, they, they will find uh, such, a, such a poor social context, you know, and uh, so they are going, I think, to, to direct all their hunger toward us. And this is it's something very strange, you know, if, when I listen to myself saying this thing, uh, because before experiencing Syria, you know, I was, you know, this is something, this is typical of, uh, I don't know, uh, uh, US propaganda, you know, against Muslims, against, you know, real propaganda, saying, oh, they are all terrorists, blah, 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 blah. Uh, so it's really something far away from my way of thinking. But uh, for sure, there is a threat, you know, for this small group of European fighters that experience in Syria such a terrible situation. Um, and now they will try to, you know, they will look for justice, whatever they mean for justice, we don't know, using the only skills they have. So, uh, makeshift explosives, and you can make explosives with everything. I mean, so it's, it's really, yeah, we'll come home in a few years. So what should, what should we do now uh, that we didn't do after the, the, the Iraq war, where the insurgency did create terrorist attacks? Yeah, you know, really most of, the majority of them obviously yeah. move from one war to another. Mm. So the majority of them will tell you on the ground, oh, we will move to Lebanon or we will move uh, you know, to Libya or somewhere else. Um, the problem is for a small minority, so I don't expect, you know, a war in Europe, of course, it's a small minority. I think that at this point, uh, it's a matter of intelligence, tracking them, 
we try to understand what they are doing. And then, of course, social work. I mean, we must we must work everywhere. You know, it's maybe. I mean, you live in Norway is different, but if you are a migrant and you live in Italy, or you live in France, or you live in the UK, I mean, it's, you are really outside everything. Um, so you, it's a. I, I live in Tuscany, in Italy, and you know, so it's one of the best places to live in, in Italy. Everything works in Tuscany. It's, it's like living in Norway, honestly. I cannot complain. Um, but still, for example, in, in the small village where I live, which is a typical uh, Tuscan postcard, you know, uh, in the countryside, uh, there is a group of uh, Moroccan guys. They came uh, 15 years ago, more or less, perfectly integrated. And, uh, you know, they, they have a job, they have everything, blah, 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 blah. Uh, then, then, you know, let's look a little bit uh, deeper. They stay only each other. Uh, they don't have Italian, real Italian friends. None of them marry an Italian woman, never. <coughs> For an Italian woman, are you kidding me? You know, you want to, you want to marry as something, something that doesn't exist in Italy, uh, still today. Um, and then when they speak Italian, you know, of course they speak the language. It's not like the Chinese who don't, don't even speak, you know, the language after so many years. Uh, they speak such a bad Italian that you can immediately realize the, 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 the poor relationship that they have with Italians. So after 15 years, still they don't speak a good Italian. This means that they have been living only, you know, among other migrants. It's immediately you realize that, you know, they are, they are excluded from our society. So if this is the, the, the context that, you know, so we have to work on this kind of context, you know, otherwise it's, uh, there's no solution. So it's, now it's, it's a matter of intelligence, you know, of course. It's a matter also of, uh, of tracking these guys and, you know, keep an eye on what they're doing. But consider that, for example, in Italy, uh, there are no mosques. I mean, recently been. So Muslims, are a lot of migrants, Muslims pray in something like basements. It's something offensive to their religions. Uh, simply offensive, you know. Why you must pray in a... I mean, um, I, I, I guess you know how many chefs we have in, in, in Italy, and we have the Vatican, I'm secular, so, you know, uh, Italians are, you know, unfortunately we have the Vatican, so we have the strong presence of the church, uh, of, of Catholics, and even in Italian policy, in the we have a church every corner. Why you cannot have a mosque? a serious mosque, not a private apartment turned into mosque. Uh, so if we don't solve this problem that maybe from Norway you cannot perceive, but in the rest of Europe, um, and especially, you know, in Southern Europe, which is the first place, you know, that they, because they arrive and they arrive in Southern Europe. So Last question. Uh, I understand it. It's an unlikely scenario, but uh, if we say that the political climate allowed a uh, military intervention by the UN, who then proceeded to control uh, Syria for uh, an inter interim uh, pe period until they could rule themselves, would that be, an, be a viable option? Uh, what is a viable option? Uh, uh, let's say that the UN uh, decided to take a military intervention in, Sy in Syria, and then proceed to control the area? No, honestly, technically, we know that UN, uh, uh, if you are referring to UN, um, UN peacekeeping uh, forces, you know that the uh, rules of procedure, rules of engagement, um, I mean, uh, the blue helmets, they are not trained for such a situation. So forget, forget the UN forces, a UN peacekeeping, peace enforcing, whatever, forget, they are not trained enough. So you should rely upon uh, NATO forces. This is a situation for Israelis or Americans, you know, it's not uh, for, uh, or for, for elite forces uh, when you have to step in in such a situation. I mean, mil under a military point of view, it's not for a normal soldier. You will be killed and nothing else. Um, so the point is, uh, makes no sense. Uh, you, sh you would involve, you know, yourself in, in a no-handed no war. Uh, no, I think that the first uh, step should be trying to, trying to reduce the amount of weapons who are being used in, and who are entering the country. 
else. Uh, even if you know this is something typical of uh, a, 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 a topic typical of um, pacifist movements, you know, uh, weapons and you know, let's ban weapons and everybody laughs at them. I think no, this is um, this is one of the key issues, you know, in war and peace. The amount of weapons that are around, and uh, we must uh, uh, reduce this amount of weapons. Uh, there's no no solution otherwise. Uh, the point is that, of course, uh, it's easy to you know, reduce the amount of weapons of rebels, close the border with Turkey, and it's over for rebels. Uh, but, uh, so let's close over the border with, like, between Lebanon and Syria, and let's prevent Hezbollah to help uh, the regime, and then we will have you know, both sides who cannot fight anymore. That's the point. Then you still have to find an agreement between the two sides, you know, but let's close the border, because here we have uh, for fighters and weapons coming from Turkey, and the border with Turkey is very easy to close. No? It's another issue closing the border with Iraq, uh, because it's longer, uh, but we all know that, let's say, we have uh, some kind of leverage on Iraq, no? so we can perfectly cover to close the, the, the border between Iraq and Syria. Uh, Jordan is absolutely closed. This is, for example, an example, you know, Jordan is doing exactly what we are asking her to do. So nothing crossed the Jordanian border, nothing, nothing, not even one way for one fighter, no? So let's do the same with the Lebanese border, which is something more different because it's Hezbollah, and again, Hezbollah doesn't ask what to ask, but to Russia and, uh, and Iran. And that's why, you know, what's the point of being in Geneva if Iran is not in Geneva? Nothing. I mean, if fighters are not on the table, Iran is not at the table, so who is discussing peace? Who is not fighting? Those who are not fighting. It's very, let's have this peace agreement. It's like, okay, let's have an agreement between Norway and Italy about Syria. Do you think we will bring peace in Syria? It's, it's the same. It's like we have Italians and Norwegians at the table. Well, we will find an agreement, I think, in 10 minutes about Syria. It will be very useful, this agreement. It's the same. Uh, so the point is, let's try to understand if we can close any of these borders. Lebanon is a tough country, but again, why Lebanon is a tough country? Uh, because, because we created this situation in Lebanon, because we decided that, you know, uh, stability is enough in Lebanon. Uh, Lebanon, uh, Lebanon is not a country in peace, that's all. So again, now the key player for, uh, for Syria is a country we have no leverage on. That's the point. But if we are able to close in some way uh, the, the route for Hezbollah, and the regime will, will be in trouble in one week, yeah. without Hezbollah, Assad is, for Assad is over. Yeah. We have to stop there, even though it's tempting to continue. Um, well, in my uh, introduction, there was this pause some of you might have recognized. Um, and that leaves space for one word that should have been there, and that's brave. Um, I'm so impressed with what you, you are doing. And this is, this is important. You are the eyes for the world to, to, to give your interpretation of what's happening on the ground in Syria and elsewhere. And this is so important, having journalists on the ground, telling the stories of the horror. This is how things can change. So, you are now in Norway's humanistic academy. There's only one of them, and this is this is cool. And in that regard, what we're doing now is is very much in line with the ideals that is in this tradition and. I want to thank you so much for being what who you are and doing what you do. And so thank you from all of us. <laughs>